Reinvent yourself at UCLA Extension. Explore continuing education programs to enhance and expand your skill set. Gain real-world skills taught by industry experts that you can apply immediately. Learn from anywhere and choose from a wide variety of online courses in entertainment, digital technology, business, engineering, and more. Winter quarter begins January 4th. Learn more at uclaextension.edu. Thank you for visiting ChristopherMedia.net. There's a new Home Depot now open on Maurice Avenue in Masspath. And as home improvement projects go, this is a big one. Use the product locator on our app for an in-store map to find what you need fast. And check out our new pickup lockers. They make online shopping a breeze. Of course, one thing's not new, our everyday low prices. The Home Depot, now open near Maurice Avenue and Long Island Expressway in Masspath. And always open at homedepot.com. The Home Depot, how doers get more done. Our biggest storage event just got stronger. The Store More, Save More event going on now at the Home Depot. Get exclusive HDX black and yellow tough totes starting at just $4.98. They're heavy duty, durable, and come in a range of sizes from 7 to 70 gallons. So whether you need to store a little or store a lot, you're going to save loads. Make room for big savings at the Store More, Save More event. Going on now at the Home Depot. How doers get more done. Limited time only. Event and dates vary by store. See store for details. Christopher Media, let's make some noise. Welcome to Beer Nuts, a weekly excursion into the world of craft beer. Brought to you by MichiganBeerGuide.com. And now, here are the Beer Nuts. Oh, it's Beer Nuts number 148. It's a lot of beer. I wonder how many gallons of beers we have drank since then. But I'm Chris. I am in Kansas City, Missouri. And my last untapped check-in was Relativity by Ellison Brewery. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Uncle Pete here in Rockwood, Michigan. Uh, good to be here. My last check-in on uh, Untapped was the Oktoberfest beer from Bell's Brewery, a wonderful multi martin Hey, JR here out in Tucson, Arizona. The last Untapped check-in for me was on Saturday, uh, Space Cowboy, a raspberry melomel mead from my friend Michael Fry's uh, meadery that just had its grand opening on Saturday that I attended. And the name of his meadery is The Meeting Room in Sonoida, Arizona. So anybody who comes to southern Arizona, look them up. Great meads there. And this is Dugout. I'm in Clawson, Michigan. And my last check-in on Untapped was Slamnesia, a triple IPA out of Austin Brothers in the Thumb region of Michigan. Um, quite good and quite dangerous. Hey, everybody. This is uh, Steve out in L.A., and my last uh, untapped was uh, Angel City Breweries, Sriracha Lotta. A um, lot of stuff going on in that beer, um, but if you're looking for something spicy and a um, lot of flavors, that's something you can give a try. All right. So we're... Episode 147, or 148, I believe, Chris? Yes, 148. sir, 148. We're closing in on the big uh, 150. We might have to do something special for that one. So, uh, again, just want to kick off the show by saying we're going to do a little bit of a different format. We're going to start a monthly format of doing an episode that we're going to call our passport episode. And our first trip on our new passports, are, uh, we're going to Belgium today. So we're going to have Belgian and Belgian-style influenced beers. So we're very much looking forward to that. So before we do that, we want to invite everybody to join us in a beer. If you got a Belgian, fine. If not, whatever you enjoy is fine with us. We're not pretentious beer snobs. We're just normal, everyday people that like to introduce more good people to more good beer. And there's some really good beers on tap for tonight, I can tell you that. So thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening. And crack that cold one open now. So I believe we're going to kick off the show with Uncle Pete. Uh, Uncle Pete, we've really missed you. I know we had a, you had a quite lengthy and uh, beer-filled uh, journey out to Maine, so I'm sure you can tell us all about that. So welcome back. Hey, thanks a lot, JR. And uh, good to be here, guys. Good to be here, everybody out there listening to the Beer Nuts. I uh, did have a trip to Maine, uh, hit 11 breweries in three weeks, and uh Boy, I came home with tons of beer, and I'm going to taste a couple of them uh, with us tonight. Since we're in the mood for some Belgian beers and Belgian-style beers, uh, 
I was fortunate enough to stop in Portland, Maine at Allagash Brewery. Uh, they opened in 1995, and uh, they have a really beautiful big operation there in Portland, Maine. Uh, it was great to visit. I got there in the morning uh, right when the doors opened, and I thought, I want to beat the crowds. Well, I just barely beat the crowd because I was able to secure a seat and a table with my wife, and within 10 minutes, the place was packed. And uh, I got to tell you, it was very refreshing to stop at Allagash Brewing uh, that particular day because the prior day, I had been to about five or six other breweries within five-minute walking distance of Allagash Brewery. There's an industrial park uh, road um, just on the west side of Portland. And on that road, within one block, there's about seven or eight breweries. And the prior day, uh, before I went to Allagash, I went to about six of those breweries. And to be honest, the majority of the beers there at all those other breweries were all really New England-style IPAs. All the hazy, juicy IPA goodness you could ever dream for was there. So it was a great switch up to hit Allagash because they're they're really into all things Belgian and uh, all the way from you know simple uh, golden ales, uh, blondes and wits and saisons, all the way up to wild fermented uh, cool ship beers, open fermented kind of beers with fruit and. Uh, introduction of, of wild yeast so it, it runs the gamut and it's just a flavor and profile of beers that's much different uh, and has a whole different personality than New England hazy so enough of the long-winded on that little story and let's get to the beer what I have for tonight and I put a picture on uh, I'll put a picture on the beer nuts um, podcast site is the triple by Allagash. It's a Belgian-style golden ale. Uh, It's a 9% ABV. And uh, I'll tell you, I I came home with many of their beers, and this one is is very outstanding and and stands out in my book. So I brought home an extra couple, four packs of this one. Um, Let me get a little description of it for you here. So 9% ABV. It has uh, a really bright uh, yellow uh, color with a bright white head. And, you know, 9%, some would say that's kind of strong. It's certainly not a session beer. But then again, the flavors and the sweetness of this beer uh, really doesn't give you a hint of any kind of heat in the background. And 9%, you don't normally get a lot of heat from the alcohol. But still... Uh, it might scare some people off uh, being such a high alcohol beer. Um, but anyway, it's got a great aroma. Um, very uh, much, uh, to me, carries kind of a, like like spicy or herbs and spices. A um, little bit of pepper. And when I taste the beer, it's, it's full-bodied, um, very sweet and very crisp. It's got uh, a lot of, uh, like, bready and a little bit of bubble gum. A lot of people characterize uh, Belgian beers influenced by the yeast strain uh, to carry a little bit of a bubble gum flavor, which that might be a turnoff for some folks, but I love it myself. Um, but this is kind of a um, – this beer has a lot of depth to it, let me put it that way. Um, like I said, it's full-bodied. You're going to get a mouthful with this beer, and it's going to it's going to swirl around and give you a whole bunch of flavors, and it's strong. It's a very um, forward uh, flavored strong beer. It says here that it's hopped with Nugget and Hallertau hops. Uh, they ferment it with a house yeast, which would be a Belgian uh, yeast, and it's very um, long lasting, uh, flavorful. Very enjoyable beer. If you want a beer that's got just a lot of flavor and, you know, it's, to me, I, I mean, some people might like to sip on this beer, but I, I certainly 
give this one a thumbs up for being a quaffer, even though it's kind of strong and full flavored. But I love it. It's I think it's perfect uh, example of a Belgian style triple. Um, they have many others, uh, and I'm going to go over another one in a little while that's related to this, and I'll make the connection for you at that time. But uh, I don't know if anyone else has had it. I know, guys, that I brought back some extras, and I hope I get a chance to share some with you. Uh, this beer has won many awards uh, over the years, uh, starting in 2002, all the way up through 2016, it's won silver, bronze, gold at many different festivals, Great American Beer Festival and World Beer Cups. Um, and I can see why. It's just a very, very good example of Belgian triple style. I might mention, too, that the uh, head brewer, uh, I think his name is Rob Todd, uh, just this year actually... Uh, won the James Beard Award. Uh, let's see if I could find that article. But um, that's a very prestigious award for a brewer uh, out of all of their peers and, uh, you know, around the country. For somebody to bring home that award, that's a great honor. And, um, you know, for all the hard work this guy has done for for 24 years, uh, you know, really developing his Belgian styles and, and all of the innovations and, you know, doing cool ship beers and they got a lot of limited beers. Uh, you know, that's great. And if you ever get a chance to hit up uh, the Northeast Coast and Portland, Maine, it there is a great density of breweries there and Allagash is definitely a must. They do have uh, distribution in quite a few states. They're not uh, completely nationwide yet, but uh, I'd say it looks like around 20 or so states that they're uh, distributed in. I know Michigan is not one of them, so that's one of the reasons I brought home plenty. And uh, if you get a chance to get a hold of some, by all means, give them a try. So with that, I'll say cheers. Uh, good job on uh, Allagash Triple. And um, pass it over to the next beer, unless you guys got some more to add to Allagash. Yeah, just uh, I had quite a few of their beers when I was in Maine and um, didn't actually make it to the brewery itself, but um, I had probably about four or five different ones, and everything I had from them was outstanding. Um, they used to have a lot more distribution than they have now. I think they kind of dialed it back to uh, uh, sort of focus on their home market a little more. Um, so it's not as easily found as it used to be or once was, you know, say back around in the early 2000s late 90s yeah well i just had uh i used to get it in new jersey when i'd go back and i remember there were a few friends when i was still living in michigan that would always ask me to bring back their wit beer and make a great wit beer so uh again uh, i have to agree with doug i've never had a, a beer that i didn't thoroughly enjoy from them and uh I, i'm going to be reviewing the next beer so i'll just go right into this but i wanted to Say that I really appreciated when you said that there were all the New England style beers, and all of a sudden you found this that was a little different. And you know, I know I say it on a lot of other Beer Nuts episodes, but I really love doing these episodes that are you know kind of stray off the everyday stuff that you, we typically drink because it reminds us of you know that hey, there's a whole world of other beers out there other than the the typical styles that are the most popular these days and you know the belgians were one of the you know iconic you know beer meccas um so it's great to revisit these and rediscover them and it's really fun doing episodes like this it, it was quite refreshing jr i mean 11 a.m the doors opened and i was there and the place jammed up within 10 minutes and i, I did Two flights of four, I think. So I had eight eight samples at eleven in the morning, and I walked out with probably you know a hundred and hundred and twenty five dollars worth of beer, probably. So it 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 was very refreshing to change up and go to a completely other style of beer, a category of beer, uh, and go, wow, there's a lot here. There's a lot to choose from. They're all not the same, and I thought. 
they were all just spot on. So it's just my opinion. But if you're uh, enthusiastic and you want to try some Belgians, you know, Allagash is a great contender. Amen. Uh, tonight is not the first night I've heard that name. So it's, yeah, they are around. You just got to look for them. All right. So for the Belgian passport episode, I wanted to actually go to Belgium. So I actually chose two beers from Belgium for my, for tonight. So the first one I'd like to introduce and taste, share with you, is St. Bernardus Prior 8. It's an Abbey Ale, a double. And later in the show, I'm going to do a brief description of the various Belgian styles. And as an Abbey Ale, I'm going to uh, hold off until Dugout reviews his beer because he's going to have a Trappist Ale, and he's going to explain the difference between Abbey and Trappist. So... Hopefully, if you stick with us for the whole episode, you'll get a really good education on Belgian beers today. But for now, I'm really thirsty, so I opened this. I have to confess, I was thirsty. I opened this before the show. Um, I'm about halfway through it. It's a uh, first time I've ever had this beer, but uh, a, a double is a, a darker style. So I'm, I'm going to just explain when I when I poured it. It had a really really healthy carbonation probably a two finger head and it took a long time for it to dissipate. It's been about, you know, 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes since I first opened this and there's still lacing on the glass and a little bit of a uh, head still exists. So it's very well constructed. Uh, uh, the beer pours, uh, and this is typical for a double. You get a, a murky, like brownish red color. When you hold up the light, it's more red. When you look at it uh, with, without holding it up to the light, it looks like a murky brown color. Um, on the aroma, you get a lot of complexity. You get a little bit of that uh, Belgian uh, yeast, which, uh, you know, there's a little bit of banana, clove. Um, not too strong like a Hefeweizen would be. But you definitely can, uh, there's a hint that it would be a Belgian-style yeast used in this based on that aroma with the banana. I'm also smelling some, like, caramely malt uh, and maybe a little bit of fruit, dark fruits figs. So let's go ahead and taste this. Take another sip. So you're getting a, a, a very, uh, probably a medium to full body. Um, nice healthy body on this. It's uh, slightly sweet. Not too sweet, but a little bit of sweetness. Uh, definitely that dark fruit that I, got, I caught on the nose is, is present. Uh, you know, raisins, figs. Not not completely full bodied, probably you know medium to medium to full. Um, tasty. I can definitely uh, taste that little banana flavor from the, the Belgian yeast as well. So uh, very well balanced, complex. You get lots of different flavors. It's like full of flavor, uh, fruit, a little bit of sweetness. Got that banana yeast going on. Uh, very pleasant finish. You know, you know, ten seconds after I'm done drinking it, I can still taste. You know, a lot of flavor here. So it's a little bit about the beer, 8% ABV, uh, top fermented with bottle uh, re-fermentation. So there is a, so a bottle conditioning. There is yeast in the bottom of the bottle. So if you don't like that yeasty flavor, you can pour it until there's about a half a finger in the bo bottom of the bottle and preserve it in the bottle. Or if you like to homebrew and save that yeast, you can harvest it and Try to use it uh, in a future batch. So the ingredients are uh, well water, barley, malt, Kent Golding, aroma hops, Hallertau Magnum bitter hops, candy, sugar, and yeast. So there's that sweetness from the candy sugar. And I wanted to mention something that I found on their website about the recipes for these. It says between 1946 and 1992, the beers of St. Sixtus Abbey and West Fletherin were brewed by the St. Bernardus Brewery. 1992, production reverted to the Abbey of West Fletcher. This means that the recipes for the St. Bernardus Prior 8, Pater 6, and ABT 12 go all the way back to 1946. To this day, these Abbey beers are brewed using the original West Fletcher and yeast. The yeast is retrieved from previous brews and topped up regularly with fresh yeast. Uh, that's all I'm going to read from this, but the, you know, the bottom line is you know, these recipes, you know, this is the same recipe they were using 75 years ago and the same yeast strain which they've propagated over time and uh, preserved. That's a really cool uh, little tidbit about it. Um, this, 
astonishing balance in the glass. It says I agree. Now, this is something that I didn't taste. It says it's typical of St. Bernard of Spears. There are salty touches provided by the water used for brewing. So apparently yes. there's a little bit of salt in the water there. Uh, I didn't notice the salinity, but that's what it says. And I don't think we go in need to go into food pairing, but um, there are some other great beers in their lineup. A triple um, ABT 12, I believe, is a quad, which is... A dark one, maybe um, uh, significantly stronger than this one, but uh, I, I do like the double style. It's a nice. It's a, it's dark, but it's not. It's kind of you know a little bit less dark than a porter or a stout, um, but a lovely beer. Li- nice complexity, and uh, you know, candy sugar is a, a staple used in a lot of Belgian beers. So one of the things I'd like to mention before I turn it over to the next uh, beer nut. Is that you know? But Bel- Belgium is kind of the opposite of Germany. Germany had the Reinheitske boat. You know, you can only use the four ingredients: you know, barley, water, yeast, and hops. Well, Belgium threw that out the window because they use all kinds of stuff: fruit, you know, different yeast, uh, you know, candy, sugar. You know, that would be blasphemy in Germany. So it's good that uh, Europe was diversified, and Belgium and the the the, the monks that brewed the beer there. We're a lot more creative, whereas Germany kind of stuck to tradition and uh, restricted the use of the other ingredients. So that's about all I have. A wonderful beer. Anybody ever had this one? I th- one could argue that uh, Belgium said, hold their beer. Do you see what I did there? <laughs> hey, Germany, hold my beer. We can, yes. do, we can do a little bit more. than. So nothing wrong with either style. I mean, that's, that's just the history of, of beer making. It just went that way, so... If you like fruit and you like you know, sweeter stuff and maybe you get a little more creative as a brewer, you're going to love Belgian beers. So with that being said, let's turn it over to you, Chris. I think you're in Kansas City tonight, so uh, welcome from to the heartland, from the heartland. I am with a, a, a beer that I think is like a, under 10 miles from where I am sitting. Uh, I am drinking a beer from Crane Brewing. They say they are in uh, Ray... Uh, hold on. I'm going to say Ray Township, but I, I know that is a Michigan town. Let me look at the the bottle here. Uh, it still says Ray Township, so all right. Towns can have more than one name and more than one state. Uh, but trail uh, it is called Trailsmith. It is from Crane Brewing. Uh, reading from the bottle, it says William Ray's, Black Mis- William Ray's Blacksmith Shop became a landmark in the Lost Township founded on the Santa Fe Trail just as blacks- a blacksmith forges metal. We forge new trails in brewing by connecting old traditions to modern ones and beyond. Our classic farmhouse saison is a crisp, refreshing, and perfect and perfect for whatever life's trails you are on. Uh, it is a 6.8% ABV, and let's smell it and taste it. Truth be told, I've been drinking ahead, fellas. You put your nose in it, you're getting a, you're getting a sweet farmhouse smell, if that makes sense to you guys. It's sweet at the beginning. And then right at the end, that kind of sour-ish farmhouse smell comes in. Uh, looking at this thing in the in the glass, which I'm I'm staying in a fancy hotel this week, guys. I got a glass, not a paper cup. You can actually you you cannot see through this thing. It is reminiscent of a New England IPA in in its haziness. I mean, it is it is light, but you cannot see through it. Now, there was a relatively thin head on this thing. Um, and let's taste it. And, and, and swirling it around the mouth. A, a lightish, crispest feel. But then when you swallow it, I mean, it's it's gotten a little warmer. But it, it's, it, it's just like the aroma. Right at the beginning, it's sweet. And then at the end, it goes into that farmhouse taste. But not in a negative way. I mean, this is still... It's drinkable. I, I I keep taking sips of this while you guys are talking. I'm taking a sip right now. It's 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 a lightish, crispest beer with a bit of heft. If that makes any sense to you guys, am I am I wrong on this style? Am I missing something? Talk some more about it. What what else do you think? I mean, that, that's that's really what I'm getting. Is right at the beginning, you get that little sweet taste. At the end, you get that little that farmhouse and then it goes down it's it's you know once it goes past the throat it's not doing anything in the chest i mean this is it's good it's drinkable it's it's not 
it, it's not assaulting your palate. I mean, this is a. I mean, I could see myself picking up a six pack of this and, and drinking this on a football Sunday. Quite honestly. Yeah, was it milder than you expected? Yes, absolutely. Because yeah, with the, with the reputations of farmhouse ales, I'm expecting to just like drink a drink a, a bale of hay. <laughs> barnyard funk. It, yes, but <laughs> There's no barnyard funk in this one. There, there, there is, but I... it's at the end. Like I said, the, the beginning and both the the aroma and the taste is sweet. But right at the end, you get that little taste of barnyard. But it seems like maybe the sweetness also tamps it down. That's not a bad thing. Yeah. No, they're typically uh, very dry um, beers, um, so you get that kind of crispness at the end. There's uh, two different, um, you know, for for judging a saison. There's uh, two different color formats. There's um, kind of the straw color, and then there's a darker amber color, and then there's strength issues. There's uh, what would be uh, table strength. And then um, a little bit stronger in Imperial. So the Imperials tend to be up in that 7 and 8% range, where the tables be about 45 to 5, 6 range. Well, you did um, remind me, Doug, that this is, yeah, I, I did not mention it. This is more of the straw colored. Okay. All right. What's the ABV on it? So it's stronger than your average six, beer. 6 what? It no, was 6.8. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. And they, they can also um, typically have a higher carbonation. Than um, most most beers that you're used to, um, and not, not also, this one. This seemed like normal. It, it dissipated normal normally. Carbonation. It didn't hang out for an extended period of time. Uh, and they they would a lot of times have uh, finer bubbles, champagne um, type bubbles. I will in, give you that. It they uh, do. It, it does seem to have that characteristic. And then there's also. Um, a lot of times, uh, peppery notes, almost almost like you put some pepper into the beer itself. The spiciness. Is to that it. that bite that I'm getting? Because this, I'll, I'll be is, honest with you guys, yeah. this is a style I have maybe had with you guys. You can count on one hand. So I, I am I am unfamiliar with this style. But it now that you mentioned that pepper, Doug, that makes that that there's a little bite right at the end that makes a lot more sense. <clears throat> and there's a whole host of them out there. I mean, there's a lot of, um, and particularly with American craft brewers, have changed a lot of things up on them and have somewhat strayed from the traditionals. Um, there's even been some argument. I was reading some stuff about the term farmhouse beers and how that's even a more recent term that that wasn't around back in the day when these beers were being created. Yeah. So some things change and some things, you know, some things have new things added into them and it sort of blurs the lines of what was traditionally a beer. You can have an outstanding Saison that everybody loves and drinks the crap out of, but then you take it to be judged and it gets torn up because it's missing traditional elements. I can tell you, this is a style uh, that, along with Sours, that I had a lot of tr of uh, trepidation going into just based on the things I heard from you guys, and maybe just because you did that, you know, I had way higher expectations than I did. But this is a style where I, I was expecting to be turned off, and this along with sours, like it's it's not as intimidating as I thought it would be, and I, I would like to explore this more. So I love to hear that. That's awesome. Well, a lot of people will say that if you're going to, like, let's say a party and you want to, you're not really sure what everyone's drinking, they will always tell you bring a Saison because it'll land in the middle. And depending on what side of, of, of you know, if you're in IPAs or you're into, you know, Belgians, whatever, Saisons usually fall in that middle where it kind of like has that common denominator where people will enjoy it. Yeah, I can see that because it's not like it's a, it's a, it's a fistful of hops punching you in the mouth. Yeah. Because, that, because that can be a turnoff to a lot of of people who aren't familiar with the craft beer is, you, you know, you get those those stronger flavors and it's just like, what is this? I'm used to my pale yellow beer, which is it, it's not it's not bad. It's just what your palate is used to. But I I could see this kind of being a bridge to like, hey, all right, if you can tolerate this, how about a West Coast IPA? Yeah, so I, I understand what you're saying, Steve. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great style, and uh, you know, 
I've made a couple of saisons with some success and been happy with it. And there are a number out there on the shelves that you could find, and it's worthwhile to go out and try one. I am no longer afraid of saisons or sours. Thanks to you, gentlemen. Put just putting that out there. Hey, it's all about being open to trying new styles. And there's only one way to find out, and that's to try them. And some of them you're going to like, and some of them might not be your favorites. But it's all being, it's all part of the education process. At least once you try something, you have an idea, and uh, the next time you try it, it helps you develop a little bit of a palate for it. And I can remember the first sour I ever tried was one of the iconic. It was a Rose de San uh, de Gambrinus. Uh, Andy from uh, who's been on a few shows gave me that one time and when I was real green with sours and I was I thought it was terrible and it's one of the most sought after sours in the in the planet. Well, you know? it's... and uh, you know a couple other sours later, I always made it a point when I was at a share, I'm going to try these sours and after I tried you know five or six of them, they I started to warm up to them. I still uh, I still am not going to drink a lot of them because they give me heartburn, but. I've grown to really enjoy some of the, especially the fruitier ones and the stone fruits and the berry fruits. Uh, you know, I've, still, I've grown to really enjoy some of them. So, but, yeah. you know, if I never would have tried them, I'd still be like, oh, I can't stand sours. Well, and now I can't say. Yeah, well, you guys use this as an example all the time, and I'll, I'll use myself as the example. When we first started the show, I hated IPAs. Hated <laughs> IPAs. Could not stand them. Now when I go out, to try a new beer, it's like the first style I'm looking for. Yeah. I love it. Yep, that has been a great discovery, hasn't it? And we're we're still all discovering new beers and new beer styles all the time, even even though we've had thousands of different beers. So discovery yeah. is half the fun. And and the label on your bottle, Chris, you said it was bottle for a uh, bottle fermented. Yeah, it says it's bottle conditioned and or bottle conditioned. And there's just a, a bike on the label. As as far as the, the main label part, you know, the the yeah. part that faces you when you pick it out of the cooler. It looks like it looks like it's a, a, a bike made out of origami, quite honestly. Uh-huh. Well, I was gonna mention on bottle conditioning, there's nothing really complicated about that other than it just means that when the beer was put in the bottle there is usually some residual uh, yeast in suspension that's still ready to do its job. And if there isn't any sugars left in the beer that's added to the bottle, sometimes they'll add a little bit of sugar called priming. And then the yeast, when you put the cap on the bottle or the cork in the bottle, then the yeast can act on that residual sugar and it will create CO2 in the bottle. And that's what will give you the carbonation right in the bottle. Well, yeah, that's, but my limited home brewing experience, that's what's when you add the, the sugar solution or the pellet, right? It's, it's you condition it in the bottle. The priming, yep. Yep. So, yeah, I just wanted to explain that to our listeners because there's really nothing fancy about bottle conditioning other than they just put the beer in the bottle and added a little bit of extra unfermented beer or some sugar and then capped it. So. Yeah, I mean... I'm going to be checking out Crane Brewing. Uh, it, it, when I come out here to Kansas City, often, I mean, it's, it's well documented on the show. It's usually a boulevard. But I, I discovered Crane this time out, and I'm going to be looking for this brewer uh, the next few times I come out here because it seems like I'm out here more than anywhere else. Awesome. So you found a slice of Belgium in Kansas City. I did. Great find. Bring a couple home. I'll, I'll trade you some Allegash. All right. There you go. <laughs> There's a new Home Depot now open on Maurice Avenue in Masspath. And as home improvement projects go, this is a big one. Use the product locator on our app for an in-store map to find what you need fast. And check out our new pickup lockers. They make online shopping a breeze. Of course, one thing's not new, our everyday low prices. The Home Depot, now open near Maurice Avenue and Long Island Expressway in Masspath. And always open at homedepot.com. The Home Depot, how doers get more done. ChristopherMedia.net. <laughs> All right, let's move on to Dugout in Colossen. He's going to have, I believe, a Trappist for us. All right. Yes, I have uh, from Chimay, the, the Chimay Blue, also known as the Grand Reserve. And Chimay, 
makes essentially they make four beers. They've got um, the um, they're they're known by the colors of the labels: uh, the red, uh, which is also known as Premier, and that's a double. Uh, the blue, which is a dark ale, which is what I have. That's known as the Grand Reserve, and then there's Chimay Triple, which is an eight uh, percent golden beer. And if I'm gonna murder this name, sing sing sense or sing songs. Um, and then there's also Doré, which is golden beer, and it's also a Patter's beer. And as I go through here, there's some quite a bit of information. So I don't want to get too wordy with things, uh, but I did want to read what the back of the label has to say. Um, the uh, registered trademark Trappist certifies that this ale was brewed within the walls of an existing Trappist monastery under the control of the Trappist community. A major part of the sales revenue is used by the monks to support charitable works. The exceptional yeast isolated by Father Theodore combined with the purity of the highest protected water of the Abbey Wells gives Chimay its unique richness. Since 1862, Chimay's secondary fermented ales have neither been pasteurized nor filtered and only naturally natural ingredients are used to appreciate the robust character of the Chimay Grand Reserve. See vintage on the cork served slightly chilled in a wide mouth glass contains barley and wheat. Okay. That's the back of the label. So we know that um, in order to be a Trappist beer, and there are, I believe 11 Trappist um, monasteries in the world that have this uh, designation. Not all of them are in Belgium. I think, um, I believe there's one in the Netherlands and possibly one in France, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong about the French one. There's, there's uh, also actually, one in New York, Spencer, I believe it's called. Uh, ah, okay. Good actually, know. it says here in the, the net, uh, as of 2018, there's 168 Trappist monasteries and convents ranging from Africa to Asia to Europe. Latin America, North America, all over the world. So, but they're not producing no, no, no Trappist brewery. No, no, sorry, sake. sorry. So, yeah, 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 yep. yep. So, 156 years on this brewery here, um, almost to the day, September 19th. Um, so, this beer pours, as I mentioned earlier, it's a very dark ale. It's um, uh, a little bit of a copper color to it when you hold it to the light. The the head on it is really, really excellent retention um, with just a, just a touch of lacing, not very much, but it, it's a uh, very thin, a thin head, and it's somewhat pale on the head. The nose is of some dark fruits and almost banana bread. You get a lot of maltiness on the nose of it. And the, and the flavor is just, oh boy, it's sheer bliss. It's... Um, you definitely have a lot of malt characteristics here, um, really complex malts. You're getting a lot of dark fruit, uh, figs. Um, it's uh, it's medium bodied, so um, it's not super super thick or you know motor oil ish. Um, the, the alcohol is noticeable, but not over the top or underneath. So you know you've got a pretty strong beer here. Uh, but but it's um, it's not gonna you know it's just it's not boozy by any any means. Um, I'll give another sip on this guy. I just love the malt flavor of this beer. So as I mentioned before, the water comes from the wells that are actually within the walls of the monasteries. So as um, as a lot of home brokers know that in order to make you know, faithful recreations of styles, you have to do some water treatment based on what tap water you have available or using um, reverse osmosis water or distilled water. You still have to bring up the mineral contents to try and mimic what um, what these people actually have as their, as their own wells. So there's really no water conditioning per se done to this. It's just drawn from the water and, and the beer is made from it. And if I can go back here, um, a lot of, let me find where I was, sorry. Um, the beer is uh, 
um, transported once it's once it's made at the monastery, it's transferred to a bottling plant, and that can fill up to forty thousand bottles per hour, of which many are returns. The beer is then re-fermented in the bottle for three weeks, as uh, we had just spoke about the uh, bottle conditioning. And then um, one of the things it says here is 50, 50% of Chimay beer is sold on the ex export markets. Um, here's another interesting point is uh, Chimay also makes cheese. And as of 2010, they offer four cheeses. You now, if anybody's interested and lives near a Trader Joe's in the fall, they come out with their Chimay cheese. And anybody who's had it knows it's just, off the charts, unbelievably good. I've got a bunch in my fridge right now. Um, I believe it is the grand, um, it's the Chimay with beer with the rind that's been soaked in Chimay beer. It's a softer cheese, almost like a brie. And it is outstanding. And they've been making that cheese since 1876. So this time of year is when I go out and find it. I love it. So I've always been a big fan of Chimay. Um, you know, years ago when I used to drink it, I didn't have the knowledge I have about beer now that I did then, but I still appreciated it for what it was. The knowledge I have now makes me appreciate it even more. And um, I love that I can just go to my local grocery store and buy a bottle of this 750 milliliter, $14, worth every penny to me. Yeah, I've had this. This is the blue one. This is the blue, yes. Yeah, yeah, I've had that. I give it high marks and... Uh, yeah, I'm with you on it, Doug, and it, and it is available. It's right there. You know, it's just, it's always sitting there. <laughs> so. And what I have here is a, a relatively new vintage. So I've got 2019, but this stuff can sit on the shelf for years. And because it's bottle conditioned and because of the high alcohol content, it actually can add some more character and quality to the beer itself. Um you know, as we know from cellaring certain beers. But you really don't know what you're getting into until you pop the cork. Yeah, I agree. It's not just uh, barrel-aged beers that can stand long duration at cellar conditions. These Bel A lot of these Belgian beers uh, can really last a long time and, uh, you know, change their flavor and profiles as they go. So it's these are these are also fun to do that with. Yeah, well, I discovered. now that I know that down at the end of the street at my grocery store, they're at 2019, I can get another bottle and I can just mark the top of this one and put it in the cellar for a few years and um, uh, let it do its magic. Set it and forget it. That's right. <laughs> and it, it, it's, it's, it's great in theory, but it doesn't always work that way. Yeah, I first discovered Chimay in Las Vegas when I was in the working for Newcastle, and my, my distributor, Southern Wine and Spirits at the time, had Chimay as well, and uh, I frequently was out with the Southern guys, and whenever they would see this, they'd buy some, and we'd share it, and it was just a treat. And recently, a couple weeks ago, I was in Vegas, and I went to the Monte Cristo Cigar Bar, and I looked up, was thrilled to see a Chimay tap handle at the Monte Cristo Cigar Bar, and ordered one only to find out their tap system was down. You got the National Beer Wholesalers Convention there, and you got like these great beers on tap. And Chimay was one of them. I ran up to order one, and what a letdown that was. But that's how it goes. But uh, great beers, and uh, that was probably the crown jewel, the one that Doug out reviewed. So great one to have, and uh, you know, and a great example of a Trappist. Yeah. So, yeah, if anybody ever asked you the difference between what's the difference between a Trappist Ale or what makes a Trappist Ale a Trappist Ale or what's the difference between that and an Abbey Ale, it's that the monks are actually brewing it inside of the, um, inside of the monastery. And for the Abbey Ales, it's under the supervision of the monks, but the monks aren't actually brewing it. You've got a beer company that allows them to oversee and, you know, make recommendations and so it's kind of the next step down, but uh, there's still some great Abbey Ales out there, too, including the one I had. All right, another great beer, and uh, let's, uh, Steve V., you must be awfully thirsty yeah. out there in L.A., so uh, we'll turn it over to you. All right. Well, the uh, beer I chose tonight um, is from Left Coast Brewery. It's out of San Clemente, California, down in the south 
uh, part of California, and uh, they've been around since 2004. And uh, the beer I have is the Asylum. It's a Belgium style triple ale, and this is a 11.8 percent. I bought, uh, and uh, reading the label says here, Asylum is a style of Belgium triple. It has a beautiful golden color. It's relatively light body. It's deceiving for a beer of its character. It has a sweet and spicy complexity, fruity aroma, and flavor derived from our distinct Belgium yeast strain. Asylum finishes with a subtle warming character to help you relax on any night. Asylum is essentially smooth Belgium style brew. Drinking great beer brings the world together. Um, so I poured this, and it's it's dark. It's it's you know dark compared to you know a lot of your other Belgium styles. Um, the uh, the head on it's really nice, creamy color, um, kind of thick. It makes you feel like you you know poured some whipped cream in it. Smelling it, you can you you get the uh, the alcohol and something with eleven you know. Point eight is gonna gonna have a little bit. The taste of it, the first part you taste is the spice. You get a lot of that spicy part of it. Um, as it goes down your throat, you, then you taste the alcohol. But it's uh, it's very smooth though. Um, it's a great fall beer. You know, I I can see this, uh, you know, hanging out at a you know Monday night football game and drinking this, and it'd be great. Um, like I said, the, the, the spiciness really covers and get a little bit of the fruity, kind of like a like a figgy, raisin kind of notes to it. Um, but uh, overall, like I said, very, very uh, great fall beer. Um, I, I know you guys don't like the uh, pumpkin spice, but uh, the spices in here is really, really pleasing and uh, great October beer from, from them. And like I said, it's it's... 11.8, you think you're going to have a, a you know harsh taste to it, but no, very very smooth all the way. I, I definitely would recommend this to anybody out there who want to try a triple. And, uh, and uh, I'd love I'd love to put it next to this uh, triple from Allagash and compare. That sounds awesome. I've had that triple from Allagash, and and uh, I that was one of the things I, I recall. It was it, the the alcohol on it. It was very very strong. It's not something I I don't. You would drink it, but I really couldn't say, well, I'll have a couple of these. Um, this one's really, really a lot smoother. I, 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 I would probably prefer this over the Allagash just because I've, I've had them both. It's actually a stronger uh, alcohol content in, in the Asylum, right? I got a 9%er in the Allagash. I think yours was what? 11.8. Yeah, so it, it hides it well then. Good. Yes, yeah, very, very uh, sneaky. I call I would call it sneaky Pete or something like that. <laughs> and uh, just to clarify, it says Steve, here they they use. Go ahead. We're glad that you like the pumpkin spices because just because none of us us do, it's kind of relief to have somebody here to represent. Because <laughs> we all run away from those, so don't feel bad. We're we're glad that you know we have a diverse panel here and that that you have you have an affinity for that. So. Yeah, I saw I saw a couple on the shelves at the uh, at the liquor store, and I was like, "Hmm, I'm gonna have to get try some of these." <laughs> Obviously, there's a lot of a lot of people out there that enjoy them. They're, they they sell. They're they're on the market for a reason. But uh, just because uh, the consensus among most of us doesn't, you know, like, again, you're a great addition to the team. The, that you that you embrace those. So whenever it comes to that time of year, we'll be leaning on you <laughs> to review the pumpkins. <laughs> Well, actually, they come out in August, and you'll find them on the shelf next August. So, well, yeah, yep, they have probably the all they come out the last week of July. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. July. And by Halloween, when you really want, might want one, they're long gone. <laughs> oh, we're bashing. All right. They're, they're out and about yeah. now, so if anybody likes those things, go get them. We're just not reviewing them tonight <laughs> or next week or the week after. No, if you recall, <laughs> and this was before Steve joined the crew here. Last year, the name of our episode around Halloween was anything but pumpkin beer. Yeah. But that just reflects the rest of us. So, we're, hey, we're diversifying. It's great to have Steve on board, that uh, somebody to represent for the, for those styles. When we do a cellar raid or something, feel free. 
It's all yours. All right. Well, everybody's had a chance to review a beer. I think uh, Pete and I have a, a second one on deck, and I'm sure Doug, I think he had a pretty big format bottle there, so he's probably still <laughs> working on that. But yeah, uh, we're I'm still just... working on the blue. Yep, and I will be when the show ends. <laughs> so we're going to go into a little Actually, bit of yeah. hipster news. Do you, do you have something, Pete? Good. No, no, I was going to say, don't forget the news, the hipster tipster. Oh, no, no, we're going right into that now. I I have a couple of things. I don't know if anybody else has anything to add, but um, those of you on the East Coast, um, not including Michigan, that get uh, distribution from Yangling, they announced that they are going to release a collaboration with Hershey Chocolate Company. It'll be a Hershey Chocolate Quarter Yummy. coming out in just a few weeks here. That certainly sounds interesting. It, it uh, piqued my interest. Um, uh, hopefully, maybe he's, uh, one of my friends on the East can uh, corral me a bottle or two and I'll get to try it. But certainly an interesting uh, partnership with Hershey's. So uh, that's something to look forward to. And the next one... Maybe not everybody will look forward to, but we would be remiss not to announce that Arrogant Bastard is releasing a Jägermeister Arrogant Bastard variant. All right. Uh, which I don't think many people will drink Jägermeister for the taste, but it's usually just a, um, a macho thing. But uh, I guess there's some people out there that actually like that stuff. Um, I can tell you that... Uh, when my brother got married, he uh, used to, everybody used to do those Jaeger bombs and Jaeger shots. And I can remember my dad saying, okay, I'll try one of these Jaegers. I've heard a lot about this. And so they had one of those chiller machines, and my dad took a sip. And you know, we all had to get a little shot glass uh, from the bar and uh, a nice cold Jaegermeister. And we drank one. And everybody went to my dad, who you know, was much older, obviously. And he, we said, uh, well, what did you think of your first Jaeger? He goes, well... That was my first Jaeger and my last. So, I saw some negative comments when I posted the picture. What's everybody, uh, anybody chime in? Is anybody actually interested in trying the Jaegermeister Arrogant Bastard? Because I am. I would. It's on my list of banned substances. Just putting that out there. (laughs) Um, Yeah, absolutely I would. And I actually did a little bit follow-up on this um, with a friend of mine. And uh, it does get released tomorrow. Um, it was brewed in Berlin at their brewery in Berlin in conjunction with Jägermeister. Um, so it's not like they just bought a bunch of Jäger and threw it in, in the brewery in California. Um, or they're also in Virginia, correct? Um, but, uh, yeah, it gets released tomorrow. It's a very small batch. So whatever Might be hard makes to find. it here is going to be hard to find. Um I'm going to do a little bit of asking around this week and see um, if there is going to be anything local. I have a feeler out on the West Coast to pick up a bottle if I can't find one. So. Well, let's just make a pact among all us beer nuts. If you find any and you're able to grab multiples, grab an extra. And if I find it, I'll buy two or three of them and I'll send a few back because we got to try this. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I, it's, know, just, it's, it's so unique. Yeah. and there's. I don't want to fight. Back. When I'm back in Chicago and at my uh, <laughs> at my old local, it'll still pour me a shot of Jaeger, so I'm okay with it. Yeah, I've, I don't I've drink it like I used to, and I've, of course, I, I well, I hope I don't, I wouldn't either. Um, but I used to always have a bottle in the freezer, and I think I still might, and hasn't been touched in years. I used to drink Jaeger ice cold from the bottle at band practice. I'm not interested in throwing punches anymore. I, I, I told what's, the first, you, what's the first rule of Fight Club? <laughs> right, but no, but just Jaeger is on that list of beverages for me. Where it, it's we're done, it's over. Like it's we had our time. It's it's the only beverage I ever drank that had me throwing punches at people. Like no, nah, I'm good. I don't need to combine it with beer. I like beer. I'm good with beer. You know, I've I've managed to to come to a a a uh, logical place with bourbon in my in my middle age, and I'm good. It's I'll let you guys experiment all you want with this one. I'd be curious to see how it would taste to do a Jaeger bomb with this. Oh, it's, I used to be in a band that we made a drink out of a redheaded slut. A redheaded slut's supposed to be a shot. We made drinks out of this stuff. So I'm just, I'm, I'm just saying, guys. Like, yeah, it's. I think small, small serving portions are are pretty much standard for Jaeger. If you drink half a bottle, you probably will be either punching something or throwing up. Oh, yeah, it's just. 
Yeah, you you guys are all you guys are on your own with this one. I just we, that one. That's not leave this I, one well enough alone. We'll put it that I way. I do. I do have a very quick story I must share from my time in the liquor business. The guy I worked for, uh, his name is Gene Chandler. They called him the Duke of Earl. He has since passed away. God bless him, my old boss. Duke. But he told me a story. Duke. Sidney Duke. Frank came to his office in Virginia wanting to list Jägermeister in the state of Virginia for sale. And he's like, sure, anything for you, old buddy. And uh, So he, they put it on the uh, desk, and they poured a shot of it, and he tasted it. And After tasting it, Gene looked at him, and he goes, Sidney, I love you like a brother. I'd do anything for you, but there's no way I can sell this shit. <laughs> and he turned down the distribution rights for it and he said it was the worst uh decision he ever made his entire career in the alcohol industry. No, because I have to I have to think that probably the aughts were were probably the golden age of Jaeger. Like it came on in the nineties and then like yeah, two thousand or two thousand ten. I, I personally think was the golden age of Jaeger. Might be just my personal golden age of Jaeger, but as far as marketing and the the buzz for it, it seems like two, it seems like the early two thousands were like the golden age of Jaeger. Well, the epilogue to that story gets even better. Like twenty years later, Sydney showed up at Gene's door and uh, sat in front of him and presented a French vodka in a blue or, or in a uh, frosted bottle called Grey Goose. And Gene once again Yummy. said, "Sydney, I'd do anything for you, but." A French vodka, come on, that's not going to sell. Oh, and he turned awesome. that down. So after uh, Jane told the story several years after making those two bad decisions, he said, Sydney could walk in my office tomorrow with a jar of camel piss, and I'd buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Anything the guy I touched turned to gold. So anyway, well, I, I could just see an old industry. Take him a pumpkin beer. Like, I used to be in radio, <laughs> right? And any time I liked a band, they flopped. So I can identify with this man. Like anytime <laughs> I thought a band, I was like, put him on the radio; it'll be a number one hit. Nothing. So I, I can understand where this guy is coming from. Well, Sidney Frank ended up selling his portfolio of brands to Bacardi for bazillions of dollars. I don't know the figure, but that um, he won in the end, right? He sure did. But uh, I had to share that story because we were talking about Jaeger. So let's get back to the beer. Uh, ChristopherMedia.net. Professional painters know waiting between coats for trim, doors, and cabinets to dry is time out of your day and money out of your pocket. Bear Premium Cabinet and Trim Enamel from The Home Depot lets you finish faster. With excellent flow and leveling, it dries to the touch in one hour. And less dry time means less downtime. Bear Premium Cabinet and Trim Enamel, just $39.98 a gallon. And that's before the Pro Extra Discount, only at The Home Depot. How doers get more done. Available in-store and online. Professional painters know waiting between coats for trim, doors, and cabinets to dry is time out of your day and money out of your pocket. Bare Premium Cabinet and Trim Enamel from The Home Depot lets you finish faster. With excellent flow and leveling, it dries to the touch in one hour. And less dry time means less downtime. Bare Premium Cabinet and Trim Enamel, just $39.98 a gallon. And that's before the Pro Extra Discount, only at The Home Depot. How doers get more done. Available in-store and online. ChristopherMedia.net. Anybody else have any hipster tips or news? Any local stuff back in Michigan I, I should know about? Or if not, then let's talk about. Uh, I'm going to cover some Belgian beer styles before uh, Uncle Pete and I wrap up with uh, a couple more beers. So uh, the first style I want to touch on is Belgian white or wit beer. Um, I'm not going to read uh, stuff about it, but uh, you've all had a wit beer. It's a very refreshing, great summer beer, traditionally flavored with coriander and orange peel. Very low bitterness, easy drinkers. So examples are Allagash White, which you know uh, Pete introduced us to Allagash Brewing earlier. Blue Moon, Blanche de Chambly from Unibrew. I had one of those in Vegas last week. So those are some great examples of that style. Moving on to Lambics. Uh, these are the you know, hardcore, uh, funky Belgian, spontaneously fermented wild ales. Uh, you know. Um, Wild yeast and bacterias uh, get into these beers, and that's what gives them, you know, anything from sours to like uh, what? Um, what's the big sour patch candies? Some of them are like that. Some of them are barnyard funk. Um, so you got you know straight lambics like 
Cantillon Iris. Then you got the fruit lambics, which are the ones that I've tended to like with cherries, peaches, and raspberries, those kind of fruits. Um, I especially like creeks, which is the cherries. Um, goose is old age lambics that are uh, ba- uh, blended from year to year. So you take a batch, you blend it to the next year's batch, and it, it kind of like goes on and on. The last time I had a goose, it tasted like stinky feet, and I almost threw up. So it's not my cup of tea, but a lot of people uh, covet them. So we're going to move on to saisons or farmhouse ales. Uh, Chris had a, a good example of that. Other styles, um, it's a, you know, usually a fruity character, usually light, easy to drink. Um, the reason they're called farmhouse ales is traditionally aged in the farmhouse at warmer temperatures. Um, so some breweries add herbs and spices to complement the flavors. Uh, some of the examples to try Hennepin from Omegang in Cooperstown, New York. Bam Beer from Jolly Pumpkin in Michigan. That's a real popular one. And Smutty Nose, farmhouse ale from Smutty Nose. So just some of the examples, plus the uh, the crane brewing one that uh, Chris introduced us to tonight sounded really good. So then we go to uh, hey, doubles. JR. Yeah. Yep, go ahead. No, no, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, doubles. We got Belgian doubles. Um, so you got uh, doubles are the dark amber brown beers, usually with a lot of rich, rich roasted malt flavors. Sometimes they're spicy with fruity characteristics like the one I had. So some of the examples you could get, you could find at most stores are uh, Oma Gang, Abbey, Abbey Ale from Oma Gang. Uh, Chimay Red, which uh, was an offshoot of Chimay, which uh, Doug out had the blue. This is the red label. And uh, New Belgium makes a nice Abbey Belgian double. Uh, then we go to triples. So it's tricky with uh, the Belgians because you get uh, a blonde, which is straw color. Then you got a double, which is darker. Then you got the triples, which are again straw color, but golden, I should say, more than straw. But those are uh, much stronger in ABV. And then you got the quads, which are like doubles on steroids. So they go from blonde, which is light, to doubles that are darker, triples that are light, and quadruple even darker. So that's the kind of the progression. So doubles, uh, hey. triples. Are the golden, more like a golden uh, ale, uh, much stronger. They're usually golden in color. Spice, fruit, honey, often flavored in these. Uh, more bitter than the uh, other Belgians. And uh, my favorite is Fin Le Fin du Monde from Unibrew. I had one, at, uh, again, uh, up, up in Vegas. It's, uh, Le Fin du Monde it means the end of the world. It's truly a fantastic beer that if you haven't had one, it's a must try. Golden Monkey from Victory Brewing in Downingtown, Pennsylvania, and Curo from Allagash, which I believe Uncle Pete is going to have before we're done. Is that right, Pete? I will. I will, yes. Awesome. So uh, that's a, another triple. Uh, triple's a style I really like, and I know Dugout likes a lot, too. And he actually brews a really good triple. And then the, uh, the kind of like the granddaddy of them all is the quadruple. Inspired by the double and triple styles, quads are an emerging style in the U.S., usually deep reddish brown in, cover, in color with a robust malty flavor profile and usually north over 10% ABV. Three philosophers from Oma Gang, Blasphemy from Weyerbacher, and The Reverend from Avery Brewing. Uh, I was so happy when they made The Reverend in cans. My neighbor back in Michigan was a, a big favorite of The Reverend, so we did a lot of praying around his fire back there. So that uh, that's a brief synopsis of the styles. Anybody else have anything to add? I got a couple to add there, Jr. If you don't mind, yeah, and I know I'm going to touch on a couple that are going to strike a chord with your beer nerves. The uh, Oud, the Oud Bruin or the Old Browns, and I know you got some favorites in that category, oh, right? Like Coon and Oud Bruin. Oh yeah, and yeah, it's an old favorite of mine for sure. And Flanders I have one left. Flanders Red Ale. Oh, yeah, uh, Crispy's and, uh, it's my favorite. Yep, yep, my old buddy Not, not commercially available, but. <laughs> and then you got uh, Frambois, Frambois, which is uh, an ale that's uh, usually made with raspberries. So uh, those are, you know, and there's so many Belgian beer styles, so to speak. Uh, it's just such a rainbow of, of flavors and and styles and colors and aromas and i I just love it because you know name another one okay you could say well pale ale (laughs) but this one just seems rich with um 
a lot of a lot of variety. Bel- so. Yeah, there's Belgian IPAs, there's Belgian style pale ales, there's all kinds of you know. The, the Belgium really gave a lot to the world in the uh, to the brewing world. And as we said before, the gloves are off, and the uh, there's, there's, you don't have your uh, no handcuffs on. You know, all you know, anything goes with Belgium. You know, and, they they experiment, they try new things, all kinds of different additives. You got candy sugar, uh, fruit. You got uh, you know wild yeast. You know, all kinds. You know, the sky's the limit. You can pretty much uh, really, really uh, great stuff from Belgium. I, I don't know if Doug mentioned it or anyone else, but many of these beers are brewed uh, in a fermentation vessel that's open to the environment. And as a home brewer, normally we put our beers into a, a fermentation uh, container and cork it and put a put an airlock on it so air does not get in. But... Uh, a lot of these Belgian beers, they like to open ferment them, meaning they're open to the air. And whatever wild yeast or strains of uh, bacterias, uh, lactobacillus or uh, bretomyces, I don't know, whatever these Latin names are, uh, you know, they're open to the air and the natural yeasts and bacterias that are in the air. So... That's what gives a lot of these Belgian-style beers their unique characteristic flavors and unique characteristic aromas. And I believe the Cantillon Brewery, which is one of the most coveted sours um, in, in Belgium and in the world, arguably, I believe they don't ever wash the walls because of that, because all the stuff that makes their beer great is in that building, and they don't want to mess with it. So I've never been there, but that's uh, certainly... Uh, Beer destination that everybody would love to go to. I wish I could tow my RV trailer over there. <laughs> well, if we hit the lottery, we can get the uh, the USS Uncle Pete. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll sail over there. Okay. All right. Well, uh, let's uh, go into round two. At least we got a couple. Um, uh, Doug, Doug, how's that uh, Grand Reserve coming along? It's seven fifty going down yet? Apparently yeah, so. I made um, I made quite a dent in it at this point. Well, I know for a fact that Doug put down a good base in his stomach at a at a nice restaurant for dinner before he started into that bomber. <laughs> well, a wise choice. Well, Pete, I think I already kind of blew the cover on what you're going to be drinking, but why don't you introduce your beer? I'm really jealous. It's something that I have had and I really enjoyed. So. Take it away. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm going to help you revisit this one uh, remotely, JR. I'm sorry I don't have one to put in your hand and let you taste now. But uh, this, uh, I'm going to say Curio, because I'm not that great at uh, saying foreign words, but C-U-R-I-E-U-X. So I say Curio. I think it's Curo, but Curo. French. I took Spanish in high school. I didn't take any French, so... <laughs> Anyways, uh, it says here in uh, the Allagash site that it was first brewed in 2004 and was their first for- foray into barrel aging. And uh, what's interesting to me is, is is they took their triple, which I just reviewed and talked about uh, earlier in the show, and they let it age in bourbon barrels for seven weeks. And once that time is up, they take that beer out of their cold cellar and blend it back with just another little portion of fresh triple and then package it. And it results in a rich golden ale, features uh, smooth notes of coconut, vanilla, and a hint of bourbon. And I got to tell you, when I, when I came across this beer in my flight, in my flight at Allagash, uh, this one struck me because I knew I was coming up on a barrel-aged Belgian, which I've never had before. And uh, I was I was intrigued, so I was thinking, okay, this is a bourbon barrel aged Belgian beer. What the heck's going to be happening now? And I thought it was going to be strong and overbearing. And quite honestly, this beer for me turned out to be smooth. It turned out to be pleasant. It wasn't overbearing in any particular category, whether it be the aroma or the flavor or the strength or the body, uh, it, it was just, it struck me as a well-balanced, 
um, bourbon barrel aged triple, and it it it's quite different than the regular triple. I think the bourbon barrel aging truly gave it a smoothness, uh, almost like a creaminess that you get when you like. I've done a number of stouts and added uh, vanilla. And I do get a creaminess and a smoothness of vanilla with this beer, which generally comes from wood aging or bourbon barrel aging. But the coconut surprised me. And it's, I'll be honest, it, it's as advertised in the description. Uh, you know, it says it has notes of coconut, and it sure does. And it's very pleasant. It's, I'm excited about it. Uh, I bought two four packs of this and brought them home, and I just think they did a fine job of not taking this to an extreme in any way. It's it's just a straightforward, smooth, creamy. Uh, it retains its Belgian character, but it also adds that nice, mildly oaked, mildly bourbon, and mildly coconut. Uh, smooth vanilla creaminess. I, I can't say anything else about it other than it's it's got great carbonation. It's got that same uh, you know light yellow color with a bright white head. And I, I, now that I you know I'm getting into it, I'm I know I'm going to go through these, and I, I'd love to share them. Uh, if you get a chance to get Curo from Allagash, uh, grab some and. I would say probably drink them fresh just because it's barrel aged. I don't think this is one necessarily that, uh, you know, you're going to want to age all that long, but who knows? Maybe if I put one away, I'll find out in a year, but clocks in at 10.4% ABV and, uh, I'm quite pleased with it. So JR, I'm glad you've had it before. If you could have any recollection, am, am I hitting on any, any notes that you recall? I, yeah, uh, I really enjoyed it. I remember maybe getting a little honey. Yeah, it's sweet. It's got profile. a slight sweetness to it. Yeah, just very pleasant. And, you know, the, the review you gave, you know, excellent point about not selling it. You know, if it tastes that good now, why why take a chance? Yeah, yeah if you got a whole bunch of them and uh, maybe just for science sake, put one away just to see. But, man, when I hear the review like that, I'm I'm not sitting on it. You know, because you it, it, it sounds like it has nowhere to go but down. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I remember I went to New Jersey for the holidays, staying at my in-laws, um, and went to the local liquor store and found that. And I'm like, this looks interesting. You know me, I'm a sucker for anything bourbon barrel age. So I didn't know what to expect. And I remember being like opening that thing up. And of course, nobody in my in-laws drink. So you know, I had a whole <laughs> 750 to myself. I slept really well that <laughs> night, and I only needed one beer, so <laughs> it was fantastic. Uh, I have a great memory of it, and uh, I know I remember picking up a couple more for the you know to take back to Michigan, and I know I had some in my cellar. I think what's cool about it is is that they took a base beer, the triple, they bourbon barrel aged it, and then before they packaged it, they add a little more of the original triple to it, so. Let's just say, and, and it doesn't sound good to say watered down, but they cut it. They cut it a little bit so that maybe, maybe if they took it straight away from the barrel, it was maybe a little bit overbearing in some regard. And so, by balancing it back with some of the original beer, I think, I, I think it did good. So, leave it to the brewers. They know what they're doing, and whatever adjustments they made worked because it's, it's a it's a home run. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks for that one. I'm going to move on to the last beer of the evening when I was at the store just today looking for you know what I wanted to have for the show. I was going to go with the Pink Elephant, the legendary Delirium Tremens, which I even have the Delirium and Tremens in class. Anybody who's ever been to a great craft beer bar, they uh, very few bars have it, but they have the uh, special ceramic tap with the Pink Elephant on it. But I... What caught my eye was a delirium red with the pink elephant on the can. First of all, I'd never seen any delirium in a can. So the tremens and the red were available in cans, but it says Belgian ale with cherry and elderberry. So I believed it would be oh. the tremens with some fruit added. I'm like, you know what? 
I've had the Tremens and it's a great beer and I would love to review it, but I'm going to take a chance on something I've never had because I'm sure it's probably high quality. So that's what I did. So this is Delirium Red Belgian Ale with cherry and elderberries from the Hugh Brewery, H-U-Y-G-H-E. don't know how I'm pronouncing it, so I'm sure Donald Trump would pronounce it huge. But, uh, <laughs> So uh, let's just uh, taste this bad boy. I have to admit, uh, it's a six. Let me see. Is it a sixteen ounce can? Let me just verify. Oh, 16.9. 1.0.9 fluid ounces. Oh. Fifty centiliters, eight percent ABV. So I poured this a little while ago. It had a really, really cool looking pink head, like just like the pink elephant. It was the same color, and you know, it pours. It's like a hold up to the light. It's like a you know reddish pink. Um, surprisingly a little darker than I would have expected, but, um, you know, dark, uh, dark red color. So I expected, you know, this big, you know, cherry, you know, cherry elderberry big, but I could not figure out what I was smelling, but it was a, uh, it was a familiar smell. And when I pulled up a review on one of the websites, um, it said, uh, hints of almond and mildly sour cherries. And it was the almond that really caught me on the aroma. It reminded me of when I used to sell liquor, we had a uh, liqueur called Creme de Noya, which is almond-based. And that's exactly what I smelled. So uh. it wasn't until I saw that review uh, that I could pick out what that was, but it was a familiar aroma. So definitely get that almond on the nose. So I'm going to take a sip now. Now, it did have a really nice... Solid, like two, probably two finger head easily for like five minutes. But uh, even now, after 15, 20 minutes of, of pouring this, there's a, a, a solid pink layer, you know, uh, covering the top of my pour. So I'm going to take a sip. And I can't get over that almond um, when you're sipping it. And, you know, part of the sensation of tasting something is the smell. I get that almond and it's, it's delightful. I really like almond cookies? It. Um, it's just that... Uh, like almond extract? I don't know if you'd say that. Uh, you know, again, I, I compare it to that almond liqueur I had, so I guess that's probably... Extract is probably a closer... I don't know if I've ever tasted a beer that had an almond character to it. Oh, it's uh, it's it's definitely... And if I hadn't had cream de noyo before, I wouldn't have been able to identify it. But it's definitely there. It's definitely there and very prevalent. So... When you take the sip of it, you get more of the fruit on the flavor, but the aroma still gets you that almond sensation, and it really blends well together to a great, uh, you know, as I always say, a concert where everything complements each other and develops into one big, great uh, sensation. So, you know, the uh, description I'm reading online is from a Belgian family brewer's uh, Belgian beer site. It says, color in sight, deep, dark red color with light pink, compact, and lacing head. Scent soft, fruity aroma with hints of almond and mildly sour cherries. Flavor sweet and fruity with nice balance between sweet and sour and excellent dessert beer. And that hits the nail on the head. It's, I'd say it's maybe slightly more sweet than sour, but the sour cuts through the sweetness to uh, deliver uh, you know, a good balance. So it's really, I'm really glad I picked this out. I, I never expected it to be this complex with that almond characteristic to it. I just thought it was going to be, you know, tremens with some fruit in it. And it's ever, it's way more complex than that. And uh, anybody sees this, you got to pick it up. you got to pick it up. I promise you, I'll refund your money if you don't like it. Well, I bet the chicks would love it. Well, I don't know, but I know I love it. It's, you know, it's 8%. It's, I don't know. It's, uh, I think it's still complex enough that, you know, I don't, I wouldn't call it a, uh, you know, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go uh, with. I wouldn't diversify it by gender. I think anybody can enjoy this beer. It's a, definitely a fantastic uh, experience. And and uh, you know, if you see the Delirium and Tremens on tap, it's a no brainer. Just just order it. If you see that ceramic, it's built into the bar. Usually, I mean, there's very few of these. I think you, know, you have to be really like a. a uh, there's even a procedure you have to go through uh, uh, to get one of these. It's very, you know, limited. Only uh, some really, really top shelf bars, um, beer bars, get these. Probably somewhere like Monks in Philadelphia, or I don't know, maybe one of the uh, Top Cats um, in Michigan. But or Hopcat, yeah, Hopcats, not Top Cats. What am I thinking? But uh, 
See, I've been out of Michigan too long. Even better, I've had too much to drink. But either way, uh, uh, Delirium Tremens is another one, and I I was this close to reviewing it, but when I saw this variant of the Delirium Delirium product, I figured I'd get delirious on it, and I am. <laughs> That's what so, happens. And Are you see that there. That pink elephant on the label is just awesome. I have a, a tasting glass, and it's got pink elephants all over the, the glass. It's a really cool glass with a, a lot of character. So that's uh, about it for all the Belgian beers, and we really uh, ran the gamut here of uh, a lot of different styles. Probably should have had a wit beer in here, but you know, uh, knowing this crew, you know, that's a little bit on the lighter style for us. Um, but it was a treat. Uh, our first Passport episode. So everybody can stamp their passport with uh, Belgium on it. And next month we'll figure out another beer destination. So yeah, I did, I did a, a review of the Allagash White, so I already had that with beer so before, so I didn't want to repeat, but that's a good one. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you guys get a – does California have Allagash distribution? Oh, yeah. We have we have all the stuff. They, they, they send all that stuff. Nice. I don't, I don't believe and we have it in Arizona. Yeah, I don't know if you guys get Oma Gang, but um, I know Pete. I know you're really, really uh, excited about Allagash, um, but Oma Gang is a really, really great. Um, you know, they they have, you know, like I said, they listed a lot of that stuff when when you were giving the description, uh, Jr. And um, Oma Gang really, really got some good stuff also. Yes, yeah, so I have been to Oma Gang when I went to the Baseball Hall of Fame. It was a no-brainer to go there and. Uh, it's a real treat going there, and it's a it's a great trip because you can catch the Baseball Hall of Fame as well. I had that on my list for my trip. Yeah, I was that was on my list for this trip, but it, it didn't come to be, and it'll be on the next go around. Yeah, Oma Gang is definitely in Michigan craft beer stores, so I, I've seen it a lot. Try that fl- Three Philosophers. That's a fantastic uh, Oma Gang Three Philosophers. Highly recommend it. All right, well, we all got the to stamp our passport tonight so uh we're gonna uh anybody has any recommendations on where we go next month you know post it on twitter or instagram i have uh, already instagram some photos of some of the beers i've had this evening so again i'm following through on my pledge to try to get more instagram friendly at beer nuts podcast on instagram amen i also heard europe is a good place for beer it's just what i heard i don't know <laughs> so Belgium is in Europe. We need a road trip. Yep. Uh, well, I guess this road is where trip. I remind you too. We mentioned that Beer Nuts podcast on Instagram. We are also at Beer Nuts podcast on Twitter. You can uh, same same thing. Beer Nuts podcast at ChristopherMedia.net. If you want to email us, just you know, Instagram us, re, or retweet us, tweet us, whatever whatever you're drinking, show it to us. We'll we'll do our best to uh, to retweet it, to regram it, or whatever you do on Instagram. Uh, we are on Spreaker dot com, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeart Radio app, and ChristopherMedia.net, dot net, and I'm sure a bunch of other things. I'm sure I'm missing, but you know when you, when your RSS feed is out there, a lot of podcatchers catch it that you need. I, I've I've looked this up. There are some things that carry us that. I don't even know about which is good because they just look for our feed and they <laughs> pick it up so there's new listeners every week we thank you for listening and jr i believe it is time for us to time depart. to go to mexico city but i would be remiss not to remind you to let's bring back win this glass chris i think just you and i might have to get together on this and design the graphic ourselves there we go there we go <laughs> All right, so look for that for the holidays. Maybe for Christmas we'll have a Win This Glass feature back. But in the meantime, we're heading to Mexico City. So as they say in old Mexico City, A-N-S-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-F-
Use the product locator on our app for an in-store map to find what you need fast. And check out our new pickup lockers. They make online shopping a breeze. Of course, one thing's not new, our everyday low prices. The Home Depot, now open near Maurice Avenue and Long Island Expressway in Masspec. And always open at homedepot.com. The Home Depot, how doers get more done.